Good morning, everyone. So good to see you on such a beautiful Sunday. Uh, if you're <clears throat> thinking you're going to hear Brother Bill Allen today, I apologize. Uh, he can't be with us today. He's got a family medical emergency with uh, Sister Sharman's father-in-law. And, and let's just pray for uh, the family, Sister Sharman's family, especially her father and all those uh, that are worried for her father. And uh, we don't know what future holds of course but we know that he's in God's hands and we just pray that he would comfort the family as they go through this very trying moment uh, <clears throat> so uh, we're going to ask brother John to come forward first preach for us God be, being our helper being his helper and then whatever time's left I'll try to close out and then uh, we uh, talking with the brethren and sister Sandy we're going to do a conference uh, it should be brief but we have some business to take care of and so we'll do that after we're dismissed from services before we go to lunch. <clears throat> we will uh, go into more detail about those who maybe we need to pray for more specifically after the live stream is discontinued and we'll uh, uh, give you a chance to be thinking about who you'd like to ask to pray for when we do that. <clears throat> uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, ask his guidance, blessings upon us as we uh, go into this next order of service prayer being a very vital part of our worship service as is singing and preaching so if you'll allow me i'd like to lead the church in a word of prayer and brother john come forward righteous most holy father god of heaven and earth we bow before thee lord in humble submission to thy will knowing that in all things Thou art in control. We thank thee, Lord, for allowing us this privilege of praying unto thee. We ask thee, Lord, in mercy to listen and heed our prayer, and that we would pray those things that would be in accordance with thy will and acceptable in thy sight, and most pleasing unto thee. Lord, we pray for the furtherance of this service now as we change the order of it from singing and prayer to preaching. We pray you would bless Brother John with a ready mind and recollection of the scripture and preach that which our souls need, our minds need, our hearts need, our lives need, and that it would be to thy praise, glory, and honor and to everyone's edification. Lord, we pray that you would bless us in the furtherance of the service and then when we go into conference, bless us with uh, a decent and orderly procession before thee. Lord, we ask that you would bless our dear church here, our little church, old school primitive Baptist. Lord, thou knowest far better than we what we stand in need of, but as we think, Lord, we, we ask thee specifically that you would bless us to grow, not just in members, but in 
the things that are as important, if not more important, things like wisdom and knowledge and understanding of thy holy word, of compassion and love for one another, for fellowship with thee and with our Lord and with one another, and for the, thy felt presence in every time we meet, that we would know that thou art of a certainty or with us. And yes, Lord, we pray, if it be not praying amiss, that you would add to our number such as would be pleasing in thy sight. We pray, Lord, we pray that you would add members to our church, that you would add faithful members, that you would add to us the young families with their children, raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord here. Bless us with all ages, men and women, boys and girls. May we never fail to remember, Lord, that in, in such cases as when you add to our number that we give you the praise and glory and honor and that we take no credit for it. We, we, we trust we will say humble and thankful when, when thou art so good to us. But we pray for these things, Lord, and many other things besides. We pray, Lord, now that uh, you would forgive us for our many sins, for the times that we fail thee. Be with all those that are listening uh, at home, over the internet, be with us all that are here. May we feel that sweet fellowship that comes only from meeting in thy name. Now, Lord, may we never forget that thou art God and there's none like to thee, that we pray and thank thee, Lord, for being our God, for being that great God that thou art. And we thank thee for the sweet knowledge of grace and of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Lord, we long to see thee. We pray that until such time, that you would grace us with thy presence, lead us along the way, and help us to overcome the evil in the world and to stay away from it. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen. <clears throat>brief greeting as he usually does and then in verse 4 in the first chapter of the Ephesian letter he says according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love if you have trouble with the pronouns then just skip back up to the third verse and just kind of read them in the same order there uh, it's pretty easy to figure it out from the language if you can't just from the top context uh, determine who the he's and the him's are. Uh, but God has chosen us. We're going to have to figure that pronoun out. But God has chosen us, God the Father, in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Well, who's the us? I mean, obviously, Paul's writing to uh, the church at Ephesus. He said that in the beginning. He's called them in verse 1, the saints, which are at Ephesus, and by the way, when we're looking at scripture and reading the word saint, um, this isn't talking about somebody who has died before and has gone to be with God in heaven, and then after they've gone to heaven, things have happened, which indicate that they're there interceding for us and blessing us and doing some sort of spiritual work before God that has an impact here. That's nothing found in scripture. Right? The only one who's ever died and ascended into heaven and does any work there of a spiritual nature, having an effect on those who are still alive here on earth, is Jesus Christ himself. Right? The word saint just means set apart, right? sanctified. Sanctified means it's been uh, put forward for a particular purpose. So if you start reading this and realizing, okay, well, we're talking about the saints, it's going to follow... Uh, the rest of these verses that I'll speak about for a few minutes this morning, right? The saints, which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Well, I'll tell you that the people are the same, right? The saints at Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus are the same people. Those that have been set apart are those who are full of faith. And it's not that they have filled themselves with faith. They haven't gone out and acquired faith. Um, each of us is a child of God, just as the saints at Ephesus 
is equipped with, we've been given the measure of faith. God has given us that gift, that spiritual gift in the new birth. Scripture is clear that we can strengthen it, we can grow it, we can maximize our faith, uh, but we can't obtain faith by ourselves. It's a gift of God through Jesus Christ. Okay? So the saints at Ephesus are the ones who are faithful. They're faithful because God has placed within them the measure of faith. But with this idea, the fact that they've joined themselves to the church at Ephesus is uh, the idea that they have exercised themselves in that graciousness, that state of grace, that state of faith in which God has placed them. They've demonstrated themselves to be set apart by God for a holy purpose uh, by doing things here in this lifetime. So Paul wishes then on them in his greeting, uh, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he begins to instruct them. And he begins to tell them about how they've gotten uh, those blessings, how they are now in the state of, uh, of faithfulness, how it is that they have obtained grace, why uh, he's able to greet them in peace through God the Father and Jesus Christ. And it is because, this is the reason, because God had chosen us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. Now we're still kind of stuck in this position that when uh, Paul is writing about us, he's including himself as the author and he's including those to whom um, he's writing these words. And this is wonderful. If you happen to be at Ephesus at the time that this letter is written and it's read in the church. I mean, it's great news for you. It's kind of bad news for us if it's just the church at Ephesus at that time uh, to whom this letter applies. That doesn't leave a whole lot for the rest of us. And by the way, I don't believe that there is still remaining um, a church at Ephesus that is descended from uh, the church that was there in a direct unbroken line never closed its doors, always had a continuous role of members, uh, never gone for uh, a a great length of time uh, without men filling the pulpit and preaching for them. It doesn't exist. I'm sure that there are God's people in in and around the city of Ephesus. There's probably churches there. But I will tell you this, there is not one that is directly descended from unbroken line the group that Paul writes this letter to. So there's not a church at Ephesus that even today could lay claim to um, this letter and say it's been in our church's possession for 2,000 years. It doesn't exist. Well, of course, that doesn't mean that the letter is no longer um, written for God's people. It doesn't mean that it no longer applies to God's people. It means only that, in a very particular sense, Paul wrote these words to These people gathered as a church with them in mind. But it is still applicable to all of God's people. And this is because God, throughout Scripture, has time and again, from the very beginning of Scripture, used a representative people or a representative person to show how he interacts with or what he provides for all his people. Sometimes... That person who is representing is actually engaged in things that have an effect on God's people. Remember I said from the very beginning, go back to the beginning of Scripture and begin reading in Genesis, and what happens? Adam there, representing all of us, does something that has an effect on us all. Not only that, though, God does some things with with Adam that have an effect on all of Adam's people. He is a representative not only in what he does and how that affects all of us, but he is also representative because God blesses him in a way that has an effect on us and shows us how God deals with all of us. Despite our sin, God has made sacrifice and covered um, our nakedness before him. Right? Spiritually speaking, we are naked before God in our trespass and sin. God provided a sacrifice that is covered, that is laid over, so that God no longer sees us in that way, but rather sees us through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. 
continue on and, and there are other men and women to whom God uh, shows favor or interacts in a way that demonstrate how God deals with his people. Right? Job, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the forefathers. We reach a point, in fact, where God also shows his favor and care for a particular people when he calls the nation of Israel before they have been. Abraham not only individually shows us how God deals with his people, but Abraham is also the one to whom God uh, promises blessings on a great number of people. Abraham stands in the uh, position of being a representative of all of God's people, not just the Jewish people. Abraham is shown as the forefather of all of God's people who will be blessed. Certainly in the Old Testament, that is the Jewish people. They are specifically called out as being the people for whom God will have a special favor and care and will guide and bless spiritually, as well as naturally. But we also understand that in the New Testament it's revealed to us that uh, that that seed of Abraham that is primarily referred to as Jesus Christ and through him all the nations of the earth are blessed. Without respect to our natural parents, our genealogy, Uh, without respect to our our race, our language, the nation in which we live, or even the time in which we exist. God reveals through uh, Abraham and then through the writers of the New Testament, through the words and the work of Jesus Christ, that it is through Jesus that all of his people receive spiritual blessings, and second to that, natural blessings as well. So when we read things like the book of Ephesians, where Paul writes and says, to the church at Ephesus, the saints... Those that are set apart, first set apart by the work of God, but also set apart by their obedience and baptism and joining in the church. When we read those things, we understand that these are things that we have in common. We have in common from time to time the experiences of these churches to whom Paul writes. Take any of these churches, take the churches that are written about in the book of Revelation, take all the churches that are mentioned throughout the Old Testament writings, and you will find either in your own life, because the churches are made up of people, so the experiences that the churches have are the experiences of the members. We're the members of this church, so individually and collectively we have similar experiences. Take those writings and you'll find from time to time you were in the same position, or we as a church are in the same position as those who are the direct uh, recipients, those are the addressees of These letters, these aren't just something kind of nice to read and pretty words and take comfort in the fact that God blessed a man to write these things to a church at a particular time. These are things also written to us. We can insert ourselves in here, right? Paul could have just as easily written this to uh, the saints which are at Kennedale, at old school, right? And we read these things, we, uh, we, we thank God for the words that he's written to us and revealing these truths, not just to the church at Ephesus, but our church here. And all the churches around the world that worship Jesus Christ and God the Father in spirit and in truth. And by the way, <laughs> even those who are not part of any church, or even a church that may not embrace as doctrinal truths the things that are found here in these first few verses, guess what? It doesn't change the fact that these words are also effective to them. In fact, these words have impact, have meaning, um, are the same to anyone who is a child of God, regardless of whether they believe anything about God or believe any of the truths that are written in Scripture. These very words are some of the proof that it is not our belief that saves us and makes us a child of God in the eternal sense. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. He's chosen us. That means he has selected. He has picked. There have been cries all throughout time about the unfairness of God in choosing or selecting anyone. I can't help it if you don't like it. I could try to preach it in a way that would help you understand it, would make it more palatable to you, would try to convince you that, uh, that because God has done it, first of all, it's good enough. 
You've got a hard enough time of understanding all that's written without arguing against the plain and simple things that God has revealed. It also just stands to reason. This is another thing that's just hard to argue with. If God did it that way, then it must be the best way. Now, if you're going to argue with this and say, well, I don't like it. I don't see how God would be a God who chooses. And by choosing, that means that somebody's got to be left out. I don't see how a God who is fair and just and holy could do that, and I don't like it. Well, give you the answer sometimes I give my kids, just because he wanted to, right? (laughs) Why is it that way? Just because. Dad said so. That's the end of it, right? If if you're not going to get on the same page with it, then you're just going to have to sit down, buckle up, and be quiet for a little while. This is the way it's going to be. I don't like to be harsh like that, right? Sometimes we got to move on. It's better, however, if we'd understand it and embrace it and say, okay, I get it. I may not know it all. I may not have figured it out. I may see in some ways a problem with it from my perspective, but I will trust that if God did it this way, then it's the best. Couldn't be any better. Okay. Now, he has chosen something. God chose the Jewish people in the Old Testament. Why? Well, I don't know everything about it. I don't think Scripture reveals everything about why God did what he did in the Old Testament. Even if Scripture does reveal it, I'm quite certain I don't understand it all. I don't know that any man ever has, other than Jesus Christ, or that any man ever will. But I'll tell you this, one of the reasons that he did the choosing is because (laughs) we had already self-selected. The problem was, when we chose, we chose death, destruction, and sin. Remember Adam, right? In Adam, all sinned and came short of the glory of God. We're sinners because Adam sinned and passed that on to us. Genetically, biologically, we are sinners. We live in a cursed body that is dealing with the ravages of sin. But understand that we also choose sin. We commit sin because we want to commit sin. So we have selected death and destruction and disobedience to God. That is worthy of hell. Every one of us has sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin are death. You and I will die naturally. You and I are dead spiritually apart from the grace of God. Now if that is our condition then the fact that God chooses to save even one is enough. It's enough. It is not a matter of God being unfair in choosing some and not choosing others. In fact, if you want to talk about what's fair and what's right, God shouldn't have chosen anyone. None of us are worthy of it. We've not done anything to deserve God's favor. And so if we want to say it's fair or it's right or it's holy, God should have chosen none. Now, we are the recipients of a blessing because God, in his love and mercy, decided to save some. You've heard me say it. I believe our pastor is on the same page. I'd be real hesitant to preach a lot of stuff that the pastor doesn't agree with, especially dealing with this subject, but I think he agrees with this. When we're talking about the number that God has chosen, it is the vast majority of humanity. I think we're going to be surprised by the number of people in heaven. God surprises with blessings constantly. We're going to be amazed at it. We're going to be happy with it because there we'll be in glorified bodies with a glorified mind, able to understand and comprehend these things. And I promise you, we will all say amen, and it is good, and be in agreement with what God has done when we're there. But I believe we'll still be amazed by it. The grace of God and his love towards his people is overwhelming. I believe that one of the reasons he chose the Jewish people in the Old Testament was not just because, like us, the Jewish people in the Old Testament lacked strength, to support themselves, to capture the land. Remember, Abraham's old, his wife is beyond the years of childbearing. They can't even get started as a people without God helping. 
And then they certainly can't grow and prosper as they did without God leading and guiding and preparing the way for them. So it is with us. Right? So it is with us. Now, chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. This one's important. Because this tells you that it doesn't matter if Paul's just writing to this group at Ephesus at that time. He's also writing about the people before them and the people after them. This applies to everybody because the choosing was done before the world even existed. And if it was before the world existed, then follow the logic. I mean, this is a tough one, right? It's like one plus one equals two, okay? If the world didn't exist, Adam didn't exist, so there ain't no people, right? When God does this, nobody exists. God chooses. Nobody had done anything at that point. Adam hadn't sinned. Adam hadn't even lived yet. Certainly we hadn't sinned. We also had done nothing to please God. Nothing had been done at this point, and yet God still chose at that moment to save his people. What was the purpose? Well, it tells us the purpose was that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And then follow this, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now I'm going to close with, with this thought. What he chose us to was predestination. He did not choose the things that we would do or not do. He did not establish all the events and occurrences in this world after it was created. He did not cause Adam to sin. He did not cause you to sin. He does not cause the good and the bad things that happen in that sense, right? He doesn't determine that. He's not even animated you as a, as a, as a Robotron. That from time to time you will act in such a way that is so pleasing to him that he forced you to do it, right? Now there are some things that God does to you and for you on your behalf, but your daily actions are not part of that, right? If you're good, it's because God has blessed you with his spirit. You are able to be good. You have been obedient to him, right? But it's not because God has directed you like a puppet on a string. It is a mistake to say that God causes all the events that occur in the natural world. Can God control the weather? Yes. He does so enough throughout Scripture, both in the Old Testament, at the time of Christ, and afterward, that we know He's capable. But to say that God sends every storm is an error. To say that God causes every earthquake is an error. There are things that just happen because this world is cursed with sin. Okay? I'll save the discussion about deism and all these other philosophies for your pastor. No pressure. Don't have to do it right now. Even. Predestination. Look at the word. Destination. What is that? It's a place. What is a holiday destination? Maybe where you'd rather be in this moment, right? I would rather be on the beach somewhere at a destination. Okay? But it's a place. A destination is a place. Predestinate means to determine beforehand where you're going to end up. We are getting to the point pretty rapidly. I, you know, I hate to say that technology is never going to happen because it just happens way too fast. I'm 42 years old, be 43 by the end of the year. I would imagine that in my lifetime, if I'm blessed to live another 30 or 40 years, which is reasonable, reasonable, right? Doctor might disagree if looks at my diet and other stuff, but it's not out of the realm of possibility, right? Another 30, 40 years, nobody would be shocked by that. We're getting to the point where our cars are going to drive us places. You're going to punch it into the GPS just like you do now, except in contrast to now, you'll be able to look at it the whole way because you won't have to keep your eyes on the road because the car's going to get you there. If it doesn't happen, that's fine. Right? I've talked about prophecy from the pulpit. That is not me prophesying, speaking about things in the future. Okay, I just have a feeling that's going to happen. We're already pretty close to it. 
When you punch that in and you say, I want to arrive at Old School Primitive Baptist Church, and you put in a time, and by the way, the time should not be 1030. <laughs> I would hope it's at least 1015. I, I mean, it, I guess, Brother Mike, we could take it as a compliment if people only want to show up at 1030 to hear the singing and the preaching and not hang out with everybody, that at least they like the singing and the preaching, okay? Maybe not our conversation skills before and after, but that's another thing, right? Set it, you get there. What have you done? You've predetermined your destination. You've said that is the point at which I will arrive. What has God done in predestinating his people? Those saints at Ephesus, those that have gone before who were his children, those who have followed after who were his children, us today, those that will come after us. What has God done to predestinate his people? He said before the foundation of the world, all those people, the ones that I have loved before they were, will be with me in heaven and immortal glory, perfect in body and soul and spirit, and live forevermore. What a wonderful blessing it is to understand that in his sovereignty, God chose us, he selected us, all of his people, and has said, no matter what, in spite of who they are by their nature, in spite of their choices, their decisions, their actions, their conduct, whether they accept me or reject me, whether they hear the gospel preached, read the scripture, or they do not, they will be with me in heaven because I have loved them with an everlasting love. I cannot think of a better way to view the sovereignty and the grace of God in salvation. Because when you understand how God has saved his people, it frees you from any fear of losing that salvation. It frees you from the fear of making mistakes and representing him. It frees you to do those things which might otherwise be terrifying in service to him because we know that though we will make mistakes in following God, it will not cost us our eternal salvation, nor those with whom we're interacting. Thanks be to God that he has taken care of the most vital and important things, that we are free from the worry of those things working out. We know that heaven is our home. May we rejoice in that and help others to do the same. What a wonderful message that was. I hope that I'll <clears throat> keep that in my mind. I pray that you will too. So solid. It's just exactly what I believe, and I'm thankful I was here to hear it. And, you know, it's <clears throat> this happens more times maybe than I want to admit, but, you know, I was thinking about the sixth chapter of Ephesians this morning, and uh, here Brother John goes into the first chapter and Lord blessed him to really bring out some wonderful truths and, and explain them in a way that can be understood. Uh, so let me allow me in other words to, to look at something in the sixth chapter but before I get to that I need to read some verses in the previous chapters and the, and the verses that I have in mind are those that speak about heavenly places heavenly places. Uh, the first one is in the third verse of the first chapter. Brother John has already said some about that. Um, it's key to uh, an understanding of the fourth, as is the fourth key to understanding the third. But let me read the, the, third, chap the third verse of the first chapter of Ephesians. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. My feeling that that verse sets the stage for the rest of the letter. This is the verse, if you want to know what, that will tell you what Ephesians is really all about. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice it says, blessed be the God and Father. That's not two different people, by the way. It's God, even the Father. Of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And it's this God that is the one who blessed us. I like that about the us. In the second chapter, he'll talk about a we, W-E. There's a we and there's an us. I think what he has in mind here is he's saying, what, you know, we're, we're all in this terrible predicament of sin, not just you Gentiles, but us Jews. And the second chapter, especially from about the 11th verse on down, deals with that dichotomy between these two people. You know, the Jews had a wonderful heritage, and they could point back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and say, these are the start of our nation and, and as such have a lot to do with our fa most favored status with God. Well, what about Gentiles like you and me? We don't have that. How, how, do we, how can we measure up to people who have those kinds of bona fides? Well, it's this, according as he has chosen us in him. There's nothing better than to say or, and to understand that God chose us in Christ. That's better than being a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I'd say. That's one of the spiritual blessings, by the way. Notice he says, all spiritual blessings in heavenly praise in heavenly places. That's one phrase. And, and that phrase is in Christ. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places, that is, are in Christ. Now, what about the, the natural blessings? Brother John mentioned that. <clears throat> uh, certainly, God is the, is the giver of all blessings, both natural and spiritual. But Paul has in mind only these spiritual blessings. And he lists them out. First of all, he talks about spiritual blessings in heavenly places that have already been done for us. Brother John talked about election and predestination. That's a spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And that, that blessing has already been done, and yet it still blesses us today. Uh, it's not like uh, he did this blessing back thousands of years ago or before time began and it has no no uh, connection to us election and predestination has everything to do with us because it's dealing with all the family of God no matter what age of time they lived in so to you Gentiles you have as much right to claiming these blessings as any uh, Jewish person might and uh, this first so in the first chapter I think he talks about Blessings that have happened, some before time, some in time, but they, uh, they apply to all of God's people, and they are, without exception, to all of God's people, unconditionally given to all of God's people. But there are some blessings in heavenly places in Christ that are conditional. Now, you can only experience them if you are in Christ. If you're in Christ, you have access to every single spiritual blessing in heavenly place that anyone else that's in Christ is, is, uh, is act, has access to. But there are some blessings that you'll enjoy that I won't because you do something that I should have done and didn't do. You, you humbled yourself. You repented. You believed. You joined the church. You, came, you com come to church. You, you're, you see to the needs of others. And if I don't do those things... I do not enjoy that blessing that God blesses you to enjoy. But that blessing is a spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And I thought about why does he say places and not place? Or why didn't he just say in heaven? Because it's, it's apparent in the way the Apostle Paul thinks about this phrase, in heavenly places. It may have been a Jewish phrase that he adopted uh, in, in his New Testament way of thinking after the road to Damascus. That there are different ways of thinking about heaven. There's different aspects of heaven uh, that, it's, that ap apply to us whether in times past or in times present or in times future. Uh, predestination is as much a, a, a blessing of times past as it is a blessing of times future because what God did for us in predestinating us is going to be fully realized when Jesus Christ comes to raise the dead and take them home to glory. But there are blessings that are intended for us in time. They're not going to be blessings that we will need or, or, or have, need to have access to when we're in heaven. 
but they are blessings that we have access to. They're available to us now. Now, uh, the, the question is, what does it mean in Christ? That's the key verse. That's the key phrase, I should say. In Christ, in Christ Jesus. That little two-letter word, in, I-N, it's, in grammar, it's called a preposition. And if you think about the word preposition, and if I can be a little uh, overzealous on grammar for a little bit, it means to position beforehand, to pre-position. So you have a noun on one side of the, the preposition, you have a noun on the other side of the preposition, and the, what follows the preposition is meant to modify or describe, to some extent, action or state or character of the noun that came before the preposition. We'll see here whether that means anything to you or not. It sure meant a lot to me. I enjoyed talking about that for the last five seconds. Uh, I geek out on grammar. I didn't when I was in high school. I wished I had. I wish I had stayed awake during some of those discussions by the teacher because if you want to be a serious student of the Bible, you better know something about grammar. <clears throat> it's not too late, by the way. If you don't know anything about grammar, it's not too late, uh, but it requires your effort. So in, in heavenly places, one such way of thinking of heavenly places is eternity and the things that were done before time began, before the foundation of the world. It's, I think the phrase foundation of the world has more in mind than just what I've, I, I've, I always say like Brother John, before time began. That's, that is true, by the way. But the fact that he says foundation implies that before God even thought about creating the world, the first thing he thought about was his people. That's what the, the word foundation adds to this concept of before the foundation of the world. Before God even gave thought to creating the earth and all things therein, he thought about his people. He chose them in Christ. And uh, <clears throat> Brother John also mentioned this phrase he, uh, uh, that I love <clears throat> in the sixth verse. This is the point why God chose us. It wasn't because we deserved it, as Brother John so ably was blessed to say, but he did it to the praise of the glory of his grace. He did what he did in choosing us for his pleasure, to, to give him glory. And, of course, we get glory from it, but the, that, the main point is God did what he did before he even thought about making the earth and choosing his people in Christ for his glory, to, for his good pleasure. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, <clears throat> uh, to the praise of the glory of his, saint, of, of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. You know, a lot of people who claim Christianity as their faith, may I just say, regrettably have come to the conclusion that you must accept Christ before you can be saved by Christ. And did you notice the use of the word accept, accepted in the verse that I just read to you? Let me point it out again. Uh, <clears throat> in the uh, eighth verse, wherein, in Christ, in his purpose, in his sovereign purpose, uh, he, <clears throat> uh, oh, that was the wrong verse, the sixth verse, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted, in the beloved. Who accepts who? Is it us accepting God or God accepting us? Well, the verse says, God accepted us. That's the most important ex acceptation, if I can put it like that, is if God accepted us, because whether or not we accept Him, it's God accepting us. And He didn't accept us. Because we were so good. I thought about that verse in the ninth chapter of Romans where it talks about Jacob and Esau. And he says, for the children uh, <clears throat> having not yet been born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Not of works, but of him that calleth. The same concept here as we've read in Ephesians. God chose his people for the to the praise of the glory of his, of his grace. Now, I realize, <clears throat> and Brother John also brought this out, 
that uh, there's a lot of misinformation about the word predestination, not just by people outside the Primitive Baptist, by, but sadly by people inside the Primitive Baptist. And I think in many respects, we've been our own worst enemy. <clears throat> but I hope you'll keep in mind what he said, and it's so true. Predestination does not have reference to the journey. It has reference to the destination. God ensures that all those he foreknew in Christ or foreloved in Christ will reach that final point of destination. He secured it. He's made sure it will happen. Why? For our sakes? Well, certainly it is for our sakes. It's to our good, but it's to the praise of the glory of his grace. Now, these things happen in heavenly places. And, and notice another verse, verse 20. He talks about, <clears throat> in the verse, verse 19, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power? That's a great verse, by the way. If I understand what he's saying here, is that we believe in harmony with his power. And I think that's another way of saying that we believe because of his power. It is his holy, divine power. I, I think commensurate to the power that he exhibited in creating this earth, this universe, commensurate to the power that he expends in our regeneration and the power that he will expend in our resurrection, God, by his power, has given us grace to believe. And notice what he says <coughs> about this. He says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in what? The heavenly places. Jesus is actually a real body, is in heaven. If, if, if anything should comfort us about the prospect of us going to heaven, you, it starts with this. Jesus Christ, a human being, also the Son of God, but a human being, is in heaven right now. A, a human being is living in heaven. What does that tell us about heaven? It's a real place. It's not some abstract idea of, 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 of uh, Shangri-La. It is a real place. It is a place that we will go to when Christ comes back to raise the dead and glorify our bodies. So he, the power of God was, is manifest in our believing, but it, was, it is exemplified above all things else in that raising up of Jesus Christ uh, he wrought this in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. So heavenly places, the concept contains at least the actual place called heaven. But not only the place called heaven, but any place where God deigns to meet with his people. Anywhere where God is and his praises are sung, are sung and his gospel is preached is also a heavenly place. Let's, let's move on to another one <clears throat> in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. He talks about the, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ as representative. That literally, <clears throat> he's saying, you and I, if we're God's children, that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we were, we were in Christ when he died. We were in Christ when he was buried, and we're in Christ, we were in Christ when he was resurrected and when he ascended. But how do we should, how should we understand what it means to be in Christ? In this sense, it means imputed. It means we were represented by him that his death, he represented us in his death. He represented us in his burial. He represents us in his resurrection. And if we're in Christ, what he is experiencing now, we shall experience one day. That's, that's a, a blessing that we have from God. And it says, <clears throat> and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in what? In heavenly places, in Christ. Now, I think this is, can be seen in two ways. One is positionally, whether it feels like it or not. If you are a child of God, where Christ is seated, so are you. You're a royal priesthood. You're, a, you're saints of God. You're chosen saints of God. And to, to be in that rarefied category of saint is, is not like what other people say, that you died and that after death miracles were wrought 
because of you. No, it's because God sanctified you through the death of Jesus Christ, his shedding his blood. And so when he accomplished our redemption, he went back to heaven and he's seated at the right hand of God. And we are seated there with him too. That's one way of looking at it and it's very valid. The second way that's just as valid is this. There's an experience that's there for us where we can feel like we are sitting there with Christ in heavenly places. And if you're wondering, how does that happen? Well, I think it's because Jesus Christ uh, will meet with us when we meet to worship him. And in meeting with us, we feel to be in heaven. Now, that's a foretaste, maybe, uh, is a better way of saying it. But the foretaste is of the same quality of the greater tasting that we'll have in the resurrection to come. When you feel that this place is a heavenly place, it's because Christ is here and blessing us with the feeling of a spiritual presence. And when we feel the blessing of a spiritual presence, we are sitting together with him in heavenly places. That's, that's, one, that's two ways of looking at it. Both are valid. The next one is in Ephesians 3.10, where he says this. <clears throat> well, let me back up <clears throat> and, and, and start with the eighth verse. He says, uh, unto me, Paul speaking, who am less than the least of all saints, in this grace is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now, here's my verse. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be, may, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Boy, that's, that's a big one right there. Don't have time to really get much into this except to say this. Because Christ did what he did, God, uh, it was accomplished what God desired to be accomplished. And when his desire was accomplished, then he let free a mystery that is no longer a mystery. A mystery that is made known is no longer a mystery. Now, there are some things that are still a mystery. He says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. It's still a mystery to some extent, but here's a mystery that was, but knows no longer. What was that mystery that is no longer a mystery? It is the promise of the coming of the Messiah. The coming of the preaching of the gospel and the presence of the gospel church in the world today. You see, it's, it might be made known into the church. Whatever you want to say about these principalities and powers, they are now able to see God's will being worked in the church of Jesus Christ. And that makes the church a heavenly place. There's not just the church is a heavenly place because there's heavenly places. Heaven itself is a heavenly place. Uh, the spiritual world that, by which we are brought into contact with God, that is a, a heavenly place. And the church, when blessed by the Spirit of God, is a heavenly place. And we must... Uh, and we'll see a verse in just a minute where I think we can even bring it down to the individual. And, and when we are thinking the way that we need to be thinking and we are acting the way that we ought to be acting, that pre presents a heavenly place, but not the only heavenly place. I hope you get my point on that. So let me read again that verse. It says, to the intent, God's intent was to, to reveal something that he kept hidden. And that hidden truth was the work, the person and work of Jesus Christ. And when we see the work of Jesus Christ, even angels are amazed. Even those great majestic beings that constantly uh, attend unto God in heaven, see him face to face, who do his bidding upon earth, they are astounded whenever the gospel is preached now because it was something they didn't know, but now they do. But what, what, what is known is not something that was for them, they know something that was intended for us. And that makes it so special for us. Let me go to uh, the last place. Well, no, to the next to the last place. 310. <clears throat> Chapter 3, verse 10. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> Chapter 6, verse 12. I think I missed one of them. Well, that's okay. <clears throat> you can find it where, wherever it is. I've, I, there's five places in Ephesians that talk about... Uh, 
heavenly places. And I think I just missed one, but anyway, time is getting away from us, so I'm going to get to the last one and spend my time remaining there. <clears throat> in the sixth chapter of Ephesians and in the twelfth verse, Paul says this, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. We, we heard about principalities and powers. Some of those things we can say maybe points to angels, but in here he's saying to principalities and powers that are not, God, not of God. They are not of God. They're not for God. They're against God. And it says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Isn't that interesting? You would think if we're going to wrestle, we will wrestle against flesh and blood. But our real enemy or enemies are things that we cannot see with our naked eye. And that's what makes them so dangerous. Because what you don't see is you don't typically think about, right? But the things that we don't see are much more real than the things that we do see. I don't know if that makes sense. But in the last part of the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians, go look at that. He says, for the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. There are things we don't see. I guess it's a good thing that we can't see them with the naked eye because it would just scare us, fright us to death. But these things whisper in our ears. These things that we can't see, they're powerful beings. They whisper in our ear and they try to get us to do like Satan did Adam. To rebel against God. To turn our back against God. To no longer go to church. No longer pray unto God. No longer study our Bibles. And Paul says we wrestle not against human so much as we wrestle against these entities and he says <clears throat> against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places now i know it doesn't say heavenly places but the greek is the same as it is elsewhere where it says heavenly places in heavenly places spiritual wickedness is at work now it's not at work in that great heaven where christ is seated at the right hand of god that is a heavenly place, as I said. But there are other things that qualify as heavenly places where spiritual wickedness sometimes seems to have the upper hand. And I'll tell you, again, I think one of, the, one of these kind of places is our very mind, the very mind itself. The, the greatest challenge for the child of God today is the battle for your mind, for what you think, what what. What moves you to feel a certain way? And these things that our enemy has against us, that does for us, is very subtle. He has direct attacks and he has indirect attacks. And I think if you study warfare, you'll find that in many cases, that the indirect attacks had a greater chance of success against the enemy than even sometimes the direct attack. And when we don't know that this is what's happening, we don't pay attention like we should, and when we don't pay attention like we should, we fall prey. We're more e likely to fall prey to the temptations that are placed before us. Then he mentions this about the armor of God. And I don't have time to get into it, but I just want to make this one point about the armor of God. Each and every one of us has accessible, because we're in Christ, and it's a blessing in Christ to put on this armor. But you've got to put it on. And it, it, it's something that covers your mind, it's something that covers your heart, and it's something that covers your feet. It's the way you think, the way you feel, and the way you walk. And the armor that, that Paul has in mind, is, it, it's like the armor that a Roman soldier, a Roman legionnaire used and with that shield of, that Paul calls the shield of faith and with the sword, which Paul calls the sword of truth, which is the word of God. I want to talk about that shield in closing. <clears throat> All of these uh, pieces of armor are important. You, you must, each and every one of you, must endeavor to put these things on, and you've got to know what they have reference to. But the shield of faith is put forth, I think, as one of the most important pieces of armor. It's not something you wear, it's something you hold out. And back in the day <clears throat> Paul lived, the Roman legions had a kind of a shield that was more like a an oblong thing than it is a circular thing. And it had on the edges these little cups or uh, divots, whatever you want to call them, that allowed them to link shield to shield. There was a formation in the Roman legion 
that I was studying. It's very, it's very interesting. It's called testudo. I mean, if anybody knows what that word means, come see me after the, after the service. I'd like to talk to you about it. But it's when the, uh, a group of soldiers were, uh, were faced with insurmountable odds with uh, archers and with javelins of all sorts being hurled at them, you know what they would do? They would get close together, link shield to shield, and shield over the heads of all, and when they were in that formation, as long as they didn't break formation, they would be able to survive whatever was thrown at them. Now think about that. The fiery darts of Satan are reference to the kind of darts that, that could be thrown at a Roman soldier. It was a dart that had, uh, it, was made, it was made of flaming dart. They would light, light the fire. And that dart, when, you, when they threw it against the shield, it would stick in the shield and then it would bend. It was barbed and it would bend. And its purpose was, if I can't stab you, at least I'm going to weigh you down. And the more those spears took uh, uh, you know, stuck in the shield, the heavier the shield got, and the more likely it would be that an individual soldier would uh, fall out of formation. But please think like this, because that's what Paul's getting at. He's not talking about you need to wear the armor of God so that you will be able to stand in the wicked day. He's saying the church, that's the key. Imagine in this formation that I've described to you, that one of the Roman soldiers, out of fear, broke ranks and ran away. What would that do to that formation? Obviously, it would weaken it. Because a gap would be formed. And it would be easier for the enemy to penetrate and wreak havoc among those soldiers. It was, it was absolutely essential that you did not break ranks. And it meant that you needed to be armored. I mean, imagine if someone was in that formation that wasn't wearing armor. They would be an easy picking, wouldn't they? Even if they had a shield in front of them, thank goodness they did. But you see, the point is, these, th what Paul has in mind is, is if you, the church at Ephesus, the church here at Old School, will wear the armor of God, each and every one of you, wear the armor of God, and fight together with a common purpose, and fight together with discipline and maintain ranks and not break faith with one another, you will stand in the evil day. You will be able to do all that you need to do in the service of God. Even when all things else are against God and against the church, if you will keep on you that armor and stay close to your fellow soldier, and march with, together with each other, and march in, in unison with one another, you gain a strength that is far greater than the individual parts. It's like the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That's why church, you're, to you, I would say this, and I close. Church is like that. It's greater, the whole of it is greater than the sum of the parts. I'm thankful for each and every one of you. But we're only able to do what God has called upon us to do when we meet together as one entity, as one, one platoon, as one army. All of us doing the same, dressed the same, marching the same. And in doing that, we, we stand a great, the greatest possible chance of being able to stand in those moments of sheer stark raving terror. Better to stand with your fellow soldier than to run away in fear. Because if you run away in fear, you're gonna get killed if you're a Roman soldier. But you not only have brought about your own demise, but you probably brought about the demise of others. No man lives in a vacuum. Every one of you as believers impact everyone else. And if you think, well, I don't, you do. Paul's saying you do. Jesus Christ says you do. You do. Don't think that your absence from church is going to de 
is going to cause the church to be okay. That, that they'll get through. You know what? God is merciful to us and he'll bless us. He has blessed us. But I'm telling you, church is made for God's people to assemble and to stay faithful in the assembly because in the so doing, we are at our best and strongest. That's a heavenly place. Thank Brother John for that. And we're going to close the service. Um, let's sing a song and we'll give... We, we will dispense maybe with a handshake this time, if that's all right, and then we'll go into conference. But we're going to give everybody, anyone who has a desire to unite the church with the church here, that opportunity as we sing a few verses of some suitable hymn. Does somebody have a number in mind? 100. Let's stand. What, what is that? Is that how firm we found it? Let's sing a couple of verses, the first two verses of number 100. And if you have that desire to join the church, let us know, and then we will go into conference. <clears throat>